So I'm going to talk about the role-to-role -role manufacturing of thin film superconductive tapes. I'll talk about the status, challenges, and opportunities. So this is the outline of my presentation. Um, I'll talk about first um, thin film HTS tape by role-to-role -role manufacturing, specifically uh, growing epitaxial of thin films on flexible substrates. Uh, next, I'll discuss uh, improving the performance of uh, rare earth barium copper oxide, which is a REPCO tapes in high magnetic fields. Uh, then I'll describe uh, our work on advanced MOCVD or metal organic chemical vapor deposition for high current tripco tapes for high field applications. And then developing uh, new inline continuous quality control tools for high yield manufacturing. And then finally finish with the, some opportunities in RIPCO manufacturing. So, so RIPCO uh, tapes. Um, are made in the form of a thin film on a flexible substrate. And uh, so these tapes, uh, as you can see in this figure, can carry about 300 to 600 times the current as a comparable sized copper wire. So Ripco, uh, because of this high current carrying capacity, has a lot of opportunities, applications in many industries, uh, in energy, uh, in medical, uh, industry, research, transportation and defense. And uh, so uh, the high power density, high energy efficiency afforded by Ripco tapes uh, can be extremely valuable in all these applications. So how do we make these tapes? How do we make these uh, Ripco tapes uh, by uh, road roll manufacturing? Uh, so this is made by a thin film vacuum deposition process. So this is the cross section of the Ripco tape uh, so it consists of a nickel alloy, a high strength alloy, hast alloy, and uh, then we deposit a series of buffer layers, and then we deposit a superconducting film. The superconducting film is only about one to two micrometers in thickness, followed by a silver layer and a copper stabilizer layer that covers the entire tape. Uh, so this is uh, done by a, a continuous reel-to-reel uh, -reel or a roll-to-roll -roll process and only a small fraction of this tape is a superconductor, and the rest of it is uh, inexpensive nickel alloy or copper. So there's under, uh, unfortunately, there's a fundamental problem with uh, making these HTS tapes. So if you grow this uh, film, the superconducting film, as a potential film on a zinc crystal substrate, you can achieve a current carrying capacity or current density of 5 million amperes per square centimeter. So for a one square centimeter cross section, the current density will be about 5 million amperes. But if you take the same film and deposit on a polycrystalline substrate, the current carrying capacity is only a small fraction of that, about uh, uh, 10,000 amperes per square centimeter. So the reason for this has been traced to grain to grain misorientation in a polycrystalline film. Uh, so this was some uh, early work done uh, by researchers who measured the current density across a single grain boundary of uh, superconducting film. And uh, by changing the misorientation angle between uh, two bicrystals, uh, basically uh, between, a bi uh, between two films in a bicrystal, so they're able to measure the current carrying capacity across a single boundary. So as he shown this uh, chart, so the misorientation angle in the bicrystal between the uh, two films uh, increases beyond five degrees. You can see the current density drops by orders of magnitude. Uh, so in a polycrystalline uh, material, obviously you can have many, many grain boundaries. So uh, the typical current density of a superconducting film on a polycrystalline substrate is much, much less than what you can get on a thin crystal film. However, of course, you cannot make kilometer lengths of uh, HTS thin film tape on thin crystal substrates. Uh, you need those kilometer lengths for making these power transmission cables and magnets and so on. So there has to be a way uh, to uh, fabricate um, thin films on practical flexible power crystal substrates. So the technique that is developed to achieve this goal uh, is based on ion beam mustard deposition. Um, so this technique um, is, enables us to produce near synchrosal films on um, 
pretty much any power crystal in the amorphous substrate. Uh, so this method, you are uh, depositing uh, a film such as magnesium oxide on a, uh, on a tape that is, uh, of course, uh, processed in a real-to-real -real fashion. And while you're depositing the film, you're also bombarding the film uh, with the low energy argon ions. Um, so it's a room temperature process. So you can use any substrate, stainless steel, nickel alloys, and so on. Um, and uh, so you can, uh, under certain conditions of um, the ion bombardment, uh, typically along uh, the EC channeling direction, uh, you're able to achieve a bias texture where the grains in the film all align with respect to each other within a few degrees. Um, so this is essentially a semi-crystal like texture. And now this can serve as a template for the superconducting film. The good thing is um, you need only about 10 nanometers of uh, the iBad film, so it's a very fast process. And uh, so um, uh, once uh, you can uh, achieve this uh, synchrotron like film um, and iPad, then this can be used for growing sub subsequent films uh, potentially. Uh, also, we can use uh, in situ monitoring techniques like the read uh, to monitor the quality of the crystallographic texture in the, in the, in the iPad film. So here I'm showing a cross section of uh, a superintending tape where you are starting with the nickel substrate. We have a depletion barrier of aluminum oxide. Yttrium oxide as a templating layer. Magnesium oxide grown by the iPad process and a lanthanum manganese oxide grown by bank transporting uh, to serve as a lattice matching layer with the superintending film. So if you now do X-ray pole figure of the superintending film, it essentially looks like a syn crystal, which is not. Uh, so you're able to grow syn crystal like film on these flexible metal substrates using the cyabide buffer layers. Uh, so reel-to-reel uh, -reel or roll-to-roll -roll processes are used for fabricating the iBad buffer layers and this uh, man transport ring for depositing the uh, subsequent epitash layers and and the process that we use uh, to grow the supernic film is MOCVD or metal organic chemical vapor deposition. So there were, of course, you know, uh, lots of challenges in sc scaling up this uh, ripco tape um, to from R and D to manufacturing, because you need to grow a potassium thin films over a kilometer, which has never been accomplished in any material system. You need to achieve uniform material current properties over kilometer lens which means the stoichiometry uh, of the composition of the supernic film has to be maintained over kilometer lens. And also this buffer stack that I showed you, it has to be maintained uh, uh, in terms of uniform quality uh, over, uh, over again a kilometer length without any kind of defects. Also, in order to achieve a high throughput processing, you need to be able to have a high rate vapor deposition, high rate vapor deposition process, uh, which is used for the superintending multi-component film, um, but also uh, you're depositing over a large area. So you need to be able to meet in high deposition rate over a large area uh, for this uh, thick films. And also uh, typical, uh, the typical throughput that is used for fabricating these tapes, uh, the process typically takes about 40 hours and you need to be able to maintain the temperature, uh, the precursor deposition uniformity over a large deposition area for a long time. So numerous advances in material science, processing and equipment engineering had to be done uh, to scale up this technology to kilometers. But it was indeed done. Uh, so the first, one of the first companies to make this happen was Superpower. This was more than 15 years ago, where uh, uh, the cyber buffer tapes were made in kilometer lens, as you can see here, with the good texture or the good grain to grain misorientation, in this case about six degrees. And this was also scaled up um, to kilometer lens uh, with the performance, critical current performance, which is about 400 times at that of a current carrying capacity of a copper wire. Also, um, the initial tapes that are actually made uh, by industry, in this case of power, was used to fabricate and demonstrate 
Lepko uh, Pimplum based device in a power grid. So this is actually a power transmission cable, a three phase cable that is made using the Lepko tapes. Um, and uh, this is a, a flexible cryostat through which the liquid nitrogen flows. And this was actually installed, you can see uh, in Albury, New York back in 2007. And that actually uh, provided this power cable made with this Repco thin film tape, provided uh, uh, supplied power to about 25,000 households in Albany, New York. So this technology of this epitaxial thin film processing um, by this uh, uh, method uh, was used to actually fabricate a cable and supplied power in the power grid. So this was back in 2006 timeframe. Uh, at that time, there's only two companies, uh, both in the US were, who actually made uh, these uh, Repco tapes. Uh, but fast forward to now, uh, we have about 12 companies worldwide uh, uh, fabricating these tapes. Uh, of course, uh, uh, most these companies use this IBAT technique uh, as for the buffer layers, but uh, uh, different companies use different methods uh, in addition to MOCVD. Other techniques such as pulse laser deposition, electron beam evaporation, metal organic deposition uh, are used to fabricate their code tapes. All right, so in terms of one challenge that had to be addressed was to improve the performance of these code tapes in high magnetic fields. Um, so if you look at the code tape, you have some good performance, you know, critical current performance in a zero magnetic field. But what happened was when you apply a magnetic field, the critical current performance degraded very rapidly, uh, especially at higher temperatures. Also, these materials are extremely anisotropic, which means when you apply the magnetic field along the direction or parallel to the tape direction, uh, you had a good critical current and all of the orientations, the critical current dropped rapidly. So this is pretty much due to the anisotropic uh, uh, structure and this is the crystal structure of the superconducting film. So along this direction, or the uh, AB direction, the, uh, the performance is good, and other orientations, especially in the perpendicular orientations, um, the current current performance de is uh, degraded. So, in, in, uh, fortunately, there is a way to overcome this challenge uh, by introducing nanoscale defect structures to achieve more isotropic. Um, performance in the superinters. So basically the way this works is that once you apply a magnetic field, the magnetic flux lines will penetrate into the superinter and the, these flux lines are able to move around that will dissipate energy and that will uh, cause uh, uh, problems you know basically your current current capacity will be will be diminished. But if you're able to introduce defects, which is the same size as the, as the flux lines, typically a few nanometers. These uh, defects uh, can pin the flux lines and uh, prevent them from moving. And if the flux lines are not able to move, now you know uh, there won't be the there won't be any dissipation, and now the current carrying ability of the superinter can be increased substantially. So, um, uh, so this uh, when several methods were developed uh, to introduce these nanoscale defects, uh, but the most prominent one that's used is by chemical doping. Uh, so this is uh, a cross section of a superconducting film uh, with these nanoscale defects. So here's the substrate, the buffer layers, and here's about a one micrometer thick superconducting film. And uh, so this film is grown epitaxially uh, with a single crystal-like orientation, like I described before. But in addition to that, if you see this columns, and you can, uh, the high magnification, you can see this uh, nano columns, typically about five to six nanometers in dimension, uh, are of uh, secondary phase material, such as barium zirconate, is introduced uh, by doping this uh, superconducting film with zirconium. So essentially what happens is this barium zirconate uh, grows by a self-assembly process uh, during the growth of the epitaxial film. Of course, you need to control the process really well because uh, by growing the second phase, highly dense barium zirconate nanocolumns can interfere with your reputation process and that will ruin your reputation growth. So you need to be able to introduce these nanoscale defects without uh, affecting the reputation growth. 
So if you do that well, then the current carrying performance is improved. This is what I showed you before. Um, in the, uh, um, and with the apply, when you introduce this Nalaskin defects, especially in this direction, orientation of this Nalaskin defects, if, um, in that orientation of the magnetic field, the flux lines have pinned well and the properties are improved tremendously. So this was developed um, several years ago and, and transitioned to industry successfully. And it's a standard product used in the industry in the last 10 years. So uh, because of this, you know, the uh, performance of the superconducting material in the magnetic field has increased tremendously. And uh, so now uh, at low temperatures, especially 4.2 K or even 20 Kelvin, you can go to very high magnetic fields beyond 20 Tesla. And what this allows us to do is that you can actually start using um, the achieving mag uh, magnets that can operate at much, much higher magnetic fields than what's possible with the low temperature superconductors, which is nine titanium and nine three ten. And of course, this, these superconductors can be used at high fields, but also at high temperatures, which makes the cryogenics simpler. So because of this availability of these uh, tapes uh, that can perform very well in high magnetic fields, uh, there have been a surge in interest uh, in applications such as uh, co uh, compact fusion. And uh, here's an example of a compact fusion device that's being constructed. Um, and uh, we're basically using the supernic tapes to make these high field magnets that can operate at uh, fields of the Tesla. And lots of supernic tape will be required for these uh, high field magnets. In addition to fusion, there have been other applications. Uh, uh, NMR, nuclear magnet resonance spectroscopy now is now using these high temperature superconductors by using these uh, high temperature superconducting tapes you're able to go to uh, higher um, frequencies as so 1.2 gigahertz NMR which is not possible with uh, using just the low temperature superconductors. Another ap application is very high field magnets so here's a high field magnet that has been uh, constructed by the National High Field Magnet Laboratory in Tallahassee, where they're able to demonstrate a 32 Tesla magnet uh, uh, where the inner superintending coils made of high temperature superintendents is able to generate a field of 17 Tesla in a background field of 15 Tesla. So these are all great uh, improvements in mean, uh, applications that happened over the last several years. But as we look forward, um, we are interested in improving the performance of these tapes even further. Why is that? Well, first of all, you know, some of these applications I talked about are really at 4.2 Kelvin or 20 Kelvin uh, because uh, the performance of the tape is still not as good at high temperatures. But if you can go to even higher performance tape, the applications will be possible even at higher temperatures, which makes the cryogenic simpler. Also, recently there have been uh, development of uh, these uh, superconducting materials in form of uh, round wires or different cross sections uh, to meet some of the application requirements for some complex magnets. But a uh, challenge in, with these round wires is that uh, you know, that takes up a lot of cross section and uh, that reduces the overall engineering current density. So if you can use a higher current tape, uh, your engineering current density will not be compromised. And most importantly, if you are able to make a high current tape for the same kilowatt meter and the same performance length, you will require less tape because uh, let's say if you need 10,000 kilometers of standard tape for compact fusion, but with a five times um, higher performance tape, you need only about 2,000 kilometers. So if you can also reduce the cost by a factor of two, uh, that will be 10 times reduction in total tape cost, and that will enable rapid insertion of ripcord tapes in compact fusion and other applications. So that's what I want to talk about in the next uh, uh, several of my slides, is that uh, we are developing a technique called advanced MUCBD for the high current ripco tapes for high field applications. So uh, a couple of ways to increase the fluid current of these ripco tapes. One is by introducing these flux spinning centers, which I already discussed. Of course, it can be optimized for high magnetic fields. Um, and also another thing is to increase the film thickness. So like I said, typically the film thickness has been used for this repco 
uh, it's only about one to two microns. If you can increase to five, five microns, now you'll be able to improve the current performance of the tape significantly. However, that has been a challenge um, because um, if you look at some commercial tapes, I'm, I'm going to be showing some data from uh, four different uh, commercial tape manufacturers. You can see as you increase the thickness of the supernic film, the critical current starts to saturate. It doesn't increase beyond a certain level. So here we have uh, saturation of the critical current uh, is about three micrometers in thickness. So in this case, another group, uh, uh, you can see that also as you increase the thickness, the critical current capacity starts to uh, st starts to uh, slow down in terms of the in increase with the increasing thickness. And another one, here also you can see the critical current starts to saturate with increasing thickness. And finally, there's another example where in this case, as you increase the film thickness, uh, say beyond two microns, the critical current actually degrades, goes down. So that's been a problem there. Um, so we have a similar issue we observed um, for um, uh, tapes that's made by MOCVD also. As you can see, as you increase the film thickness, the current carrying capacity starts to plateau. And the reason for this is quite simple. When you uh, have a film which is say, two microns in thickness, you see uh, a good epitaxial film. Of course, it still has some disoriented grains. But once you make the film such a five microns in thickness, the film quality degrades substantially. We start to see disoriented grains and the A axis grains, which is also seen in this X ray diffraction pattern. And, uh, uh, and of course, once you have that kind of disoriented grains, the the critical current performance start to uh, plateau. And uh, what we found is that it's, uh, the, it's not really a fundamental issue. It's really in terms of uh, the, the reason this happens, at least in MOCVD, is because of challenge in process control. So here I'm showing a schematic of an MOCVD reactor where the precursor is being delivered through a shower head and that's being deposited on a heated tape uh, riding over a susceptor. Um, you can see a, a photograph of this heating of this tape, typically about 800 degrees C um, uh, in, in the, or the susceptor. The problem is that while the temperature control is very critical uh, to get good performance, especially in thick films, uh, we're not able to uh, monitor or control the tape temperature really well uh, by this method. Additionally, uh, we've done some simulation of the flow pattern of the precursors over the tape we see that there's quite a lot of non-uniformities that also causes non-uniformity in the temperature of the tape. So basically we found that the conventional MOC system design is not suitable for the level of process control needed to make high performance thick film tapes. So we developed an alternate technique, we call it a advanced MOCVD. So basically what we did was um, we eliminated the heater. So there's no heater involved because the tape that we use is uh, quite resistive. We inject current directly into the tape and can heat the tape up to 800 degrees C without any problem. Second thing is we remove the shower head and uh, we essentially create a laminar flow channel where the precursor is flowing in a narrow gap over the, uh, over the tape. And uh, so by this method, we are able to, first of all, able to control the tape temperature really well uh, within a degree or so, as well as um, we can also achieve a good efficiency of raw material conversion to the superconducting film. Typical uh, MOCVD processes, the conversion efficiency of the precursor is only about 10%. In our case, we're able to achieve uh, almost four times increase in the conversion efficiency to almost 50%. That uh, leads to a substantial reduction in the overall tape cost because the precursors are a significant portion of the tape cost. So here I'm showing some uh, microstructures of this tape and uh, these are highly reflective. You can see in this reflection of this rod here on the tape. And then here we can see that uh, you know, from a surface morphology is very smooth. Uh, there's no misoriented grains uh, like we see in a tape made by conventional MOCVD. X-ray diffraction pattern also shows a highly, highly aligned films. Again, four to five micron films are made in a single pass by advancing OCVD. Also, uh, you can see uh, the quality of the film is maintained over the entire film thickness. 
uh, here as you increase the film thickness from one micron to five microns, the picture, the crystallographic alignment of these grains in the film is more or less constant over the entire thickness. Um, also, the critical current performance of this tape does not degrade or does not plateau with increasing thickness, even which keeps increasing linearly. And we're able to achieve uh, some really high performance, about 1600 amperes at 77 k zero test lab in a four micron film, which is about uh, three million amp per square centimeter. So clearly there is a good opportunity to uh, make use of these thickness tapes uh, to improve uh, the critical current of these um, the core co tapes. So uh, using this method, uh, we have been able to accomplish um, uh, some really high performance tapes uh, for application. This is for next generation electric machines that can operate in uh, high temperature in a low magnetic field, about one to three Tesla. And uh, this is performance of this tape plus 65 Kelvin in liquid and nitrogen temperature in a magnetic field. And this is the tape that we have made by our method, advanced MOCD method. Um, and they can see some four times higher than the commercial tape. Additionally, we found that uh, we can actually tailor uh, the composition of the tapes, uh, the films, uh, by uh, tailoring the barium content in the films, we were able to actually uh, achieve higher performance in high magnetic fields at lower temperatures. So here I'm showing the data of the current, current, current density as a function of the film composition, mainly the barium composition in the film. And you can see as the barium composition increases, the peak current density is achieved at higher magnetic fields. And this uh, barium circonate nano columns are able to be maintained uh, consistently over the entire thickness of this four micron thick film. So because of that, we are able to achieve some excellent uh, performance of these tapes. So this is kind of a commercial tape, uh, the engineering current density of commercial tape. These are a few other types of tapes, uh, the types of supporting uh, wires that are being used. And here is the tape that we made with advanced MOCVD method. And uh, so clearly a huge improvement in the performance from, from the state of the art. And this actually shows the data in terms of critical current, uh, in current current capacity. Um, these are the tapes that are made with advanced MOCVD method shown in here. It's at 4.2 Kelvin in magnetic fields of 30 Tesla. And these are some of the best tapes. Uh, it's the best uh, industry tape made by pulse laser deposition, and this is the best uh, tape uh, made by MOCVD. Uh, so you clearly can see using this advanced MOCVD method by making the thick film tapes, you're able to achieve some excellent critical performance in high magnetic fields. All right, so that's great. But now we should be able to make these tapes in long lens, which means you need to be able to control the quality of these tapes uh, for high in manufacturing. Uh, so uh, this shows uh, a photograph of a pilot scale advanced MOCV2 that we set up for making these tapes in long lens. And here you can show a photograph of this tape that's been heated over a, almost a meter long depression zone and so by direct heating by flowing current into the tape. So the challenge in achieving this excellent performance uh, over long lens is that you should be able to control your film composition in a very narrow range. So what I'm showing here is a compositional diagram, copper, rare earth, barium, and zirconium. And uh, this here uh, shows you the, the current density of these uh, films in a magnetic field of 4.2K in Tesla. So what you can see is that uh, in only in a very narrow range of composition of copper, rare earth, and barium, and zirconium, you're able to achieve that high performance, which means you need to be able to control the composition of the film over a long length uh, in a consistent manner. And this measurement was done by inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy, which is a destructive method, which obviously is not suitable for measuring the composition of long tapes. So a non-destructive method is needed for rapid evaluation of the film composition for long tape manufacturing. Fortunately, we were able to develop such a technique. Uh, so that technique is based on two-dimensional X-ray diffraction. So this is a two-dimensional X-ray diffraction data we obtained from two different tapes, one of the normal barium, one of the high barium. Uh, these spots here shows the C-axis aligned peaks, uh, which of course is present in both cases. But if you zoom into this area of this diffraction pattern, 
uh, uh, shown here. This is a normal barium, that's a high barium. That's a Repco uh, peak, and that's a barium zirconate peak. And you can clearly see the difference when the composition of the film, uh, we have more barium, the, uh, the uh, barium zirconate peak actually shifts towards the Repco peak. And uh, that is uh, very, the reason for this is quite simple is that as the barium composition in the film increases, uh, the, the lattice parameter of the barium zirconate actually decreases. And actually the lattice parameter of the Repco actually slightly increases. So the mismatch between the two decreases and that's why you can see the angle between the two of them decreases. So now we can actually make use of this method uh, and as a way to evaluate the composition of the film. So that's what we've done here. So basically looking at the angle between these two peaks, the Ripco peak and the variance zirconate peak, and that's plotted here. And you can see that correlates quite well to the composition, especially the barium composition of the film. Smaller the angle, uh, higher the barium content. And also correspondingly, smaller the angle, higher the barium content, but also higher the critical current performance in high magnetic fields. Um, so clearly the, the, what we call the streak deviation angle is a good indicator of the nano columns and also the film composition of the tape. So based upon this finding, uh, we have set up uh, inline X-ray diffraction, two-dimensional X-ray diffraction system in our pilot MOCD2. Here's a photograph of the system. And uh, so um, here's the spool box that the tape comes in, it's deposited and we grow the superconducting film. And before the tape gets uh, spooled up, we're able to monitor the quality by the two-dimensional X-ray diffraction. Here's a tape path, here's X-ray source, and here's a two-dimensional X-ray direct. So with this method, we can actually measure the intensity and the spread of various peaks, as well as the streak deviation angle between the Repco and the barium zirconite peak. Here I'm gonna show uh, data uh, from a couple of these tapes. Uh, so this data is continuously acquired over the fabrication of these long tapes. So the 005 peak of the superintendent 003, rare oxide 400, and these two peaks uh, uh, the streak deviation between these two peaks, all of this information uh, can be obtained in real time as we fabricate this tape uh, by this two dimension X ray diffraction. Uh, and here's the data of the intensity of these various peaks, you know, the Ripco peaks, the VCO peak, this is a rare toxic peak, all obtained over uh, the length of the tape that's fabricated. And here also I'm showing the, the streak deviation angle that I mentioned before um, over the length of these two tapes. Here you can see some more uh, variation in the streak deviation angle. Uh, here's a bit tighter there. So basically the real-time X-ray diffraction data uh, can shed a lot of light about the quality of the tape. Uh, the next is to use this method for controlling the process so that it can be really for performance. All right, so uh, finally to wrap up, uh, you know, uh, the idea here is uh, using this uh, X-ray diffraction data, uh, we can actually use, uh, we can try to uh, correlate uh, the data to the performance. The critical current of the tape is shown in here. Uh, here are various um, in features, this intensity of these various peaks. Here's the streak deviation angle. Here's the spread of the various peaks. For instance, you can clearly see the critical current um, has a good positive correlation with the rare earth oxide peak and a strong negative correlation with the spread of the 005 peak. So by using this analysis, and of course, we're also looking into some machine learning techniques, because using the process data as well as the quality data to get some real-time assessment of the superintendent tape performance and use that for controlling uh, the quality of the tape in while processing. So in terms of opportunities in Ripco manufacturing, I think uh, the name of the game is really to get the lower cost. Uh, I think that's gonna be possible by high yield manufacturing. So we have this uh, high performance tapes, uh, we should scale up to long lens. And I really think using inline quality control uh, with the feedback of the process will help us to get this uniform consistent performance. Also, uh, new tools have to be developed 
for testing these tapes um, in long length, um, especially for the infield performance. So a lot of quality control, quality assurance tools have to be developed for these processes. Also, um, you need to scale up uh, the throughput. You know, typically if you look at uh, the industry uh, throughput of industry processes is few hundred kilometers per year, maybe up to a thousand at most, but this has to go into tens of thousands of kilometers per year. So high throughput processes is essential. Also, I think there are opportunities to uh, incorporate features which are important for applications, uh, such as uh, quench tolerance. This basically uh, ability of the tape to withstand any sharp by increase in localized heating of the tape um, because of some defects. Mechanical robustness of the tape is very important. High strength tape, flexible tapes for making some complex coil geometries and uh, different uh, uh, geometries like round geometries, which is useful for a lot of applications and low loss uh, tapes. So many features I think can be incorporated into the tape. I think that will really accelerate the applications. But certainly I'd like to finish saying that uh, this decade, I really believe is where uh, HTS really takes off to a real commercial large volume product. Thank you for your attention.